in my opinion, there's no, it makes no sense to, to be concerned with alchemy or the concept or the, even the term, unless you kind of know where, what it means and where it's from. You have a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of new, these integral study um, groups and, and uh, self-help groups that use the word alchemy, like used for everything. So, you know, sure, you know, you're getting, it's getting to be that same th same old thing with America where, you know, it's so commercial that people are wearing something that used to be sacred on a t-shirt or a hat or a bumper sticker. So, um, but what we're going to do first, when, I, when uh, everybody settles in about another minute, is I'm going to just do a little bit of soft breathing, relaxing, just getting into the mood for it. And then we're, we're going to get into uh, a couple of deeper meditations in, in the later sessions. Um, but today's really just about getting everybody in a, in a group and um, going through some of this interesting material. I, I hope it'll be interesting for you. I'm, I'm sure it will be. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a strand of history that doesn't get told that often. And when it, when it does, it's usually told the wrong way. Um, so I'm trying to make that part of this, you know, to kind of tie that, that long thread, 3,000 year thread together and, and in a way that makes sense instead of just jumping all over the place. Uh, so we're going to do that. So it should be fun. All right, so I'll just invite everybody just to relax, let your body settle, clear your mind of everything else that what we're doing here. And we're just going to take about two to three minutes to just relax the self and become present as best we possibly can. Just take a couple of deep breaths through the nose or the mouth. Listen to the breath. Watch it with your eyes closed. Going in and out. Settling the muscles of your body, settling your chest, settling your mind, and just be with it. Relaxing, calming, beat by beat, slowing down, becoming at peace, at rest, in its normal rhythm. If it's going a little fast like mine is, breathe a little deeper, let that air out. Let that static energy to release. at how vivid the pictures can be, even with your eyes closed. We're going to be taking a trip today back into the deep archaic, all the way back to Aristotle. I'm going to learn about how this core thread of truth lasted somehow through all all sorts of trials and tribulations, being driven underground, being forgotten, and somehow remains with us. I'll take a good last cleansing breath and then we'll go ahead and get started. How's everybody feeling? Good? All right, I'm gonna, go ahead. I'm gonna lay this out before I share the, the slides with you. What we're going to be doing with this workshop is sort of two things, but there's a bottom line to it. The bottom line comes down to what can we get out of it that we can use in our lives, what can actually apply and, uh, and make sense in our daily, daily lives, something that we can actually benefit from. Um, and beside that, there's a, there's a whole string of very uh, vivid and, and, powerful imagery and archetypal um, ideas that uh, go along with the philosophy. The uh, alchemy that we're talking about is a personal alchemy, which means it's, it's fit for any belief system, any attitude, any uh, worldview. So it's applicable to anyone because it, this is an underlying thing that goes, that fits any, any size. So that's the beauty of alchemy. As a, as a spiritual practice, and that's the value of it that I'm going to go for. 
Um, the spiritual uh, aspect, traditionally, with the alchemist, was hermeticism. Hermeticism, we're going to talk about it right now with these slides, is the, it was kind of the, not the antithesis to the emerging monotheistic religions of the archaic, but it was, it was a, it was a stubborn one in a way. Um, the idea of Hermes, Trismegistus, the, the thrice blessed, being this almost celestial being that traveled the world and was the wisest person that ever lived is, is very kind of hard to wrap your mind around the concept. Um, but Hermes told almost all the same poignant stories from the Bible, Sermon on the Mount, you know, Genesis, all of it. So all of those stories exist in a different form in Hermeticism. And, uh, and, it all, and Hermeticism also in, came to include the Hebrew Kabbalah, Tantric Yoga, astrology, tarot cards, all of those things that are in the modern um, New Age movement came from Hermeticism and the alchemists. Uh, if you ever messed with tarot cards or anything, you've seen some of these types of imagery, if, if not these exact ones elsewhere. And they come from the alchemy eros. So I'm going to share the screen and we're going to go ahead and get into some of this stuff. All right, so the question on everyone's mind when, when the subject comes up, what's alchemy? It's an arcane occult science of unknown origin. I don't care what anybody else tells you, that's a fact. It, it is of unknown origin. Um, like I said, there's uh, a lot of things that happened in the Greek classical that um, point to the emergence of alchemy uh, somewhere, somewhere along that, that uh, very long time period. Basically, alchemy was a substance um, that, that they believed all life uh, and existed in all in all things. And the world was dead. And so, the, this primum is in rock, is in the air, in the teachings, it was a theme that developed, and it was seen as a and it was an extremely bold concept for most people to, but um, it's, a, it's a little bit later on that we're going to talk about that in detail. Uh, the idea was the Philosopher's Stone was a material representation of prima materia that would essentially create anything. So in order to achieve this, you know, we on Earth because it was any system. And then the other goal was the other if you would have, if you were to and achieve an elixir of life made of prima materia, you could drink it and theoretically it would become part of your body and you could never die, you could never get ill. These were two lofty um, goals that they had for themselves and uh, they believed fully that they could achieve. Uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, a, lot of, a lot of alchemists, not all of them, uh, that's a, a real misnomer with this, um, became very concerned with the idea of transmutating base metals into gold. Um, and this was when uh, gold be was, you know, really becoming a commodity. And so when it was fully realized how powerful such a, a process would be to someone, uh, there were thousands. There were, at the time, that uh, was uh, experimenting with it. Um, and the alchemists of, uh, of the lineage that were so long uh, shooting for this gold of the Philosopher's Stone thought gold might even be more possible. Um, so it became sort of an obsession uh, all over Europe during the Middle Ages. Um, and it, it really came down to a bad ending with that. You ended up having many people um, charged with heresy, some burned at the stake. So um, the idea that alchemists only concern was to was to transmit lesser that's really not true. But there was a light to alchemy. There always was. The alchemists always believed that the spiritual self was part of it. Even if they were smelting metals or uh, pulverizing a stone or chemically dissolving something, their I their view of the world and the process was that it would only happen correctly if it was watched and and actually engaged with on a spiritual level. So um, alchemy was not, a, not just a material art, it, but it was a 
holistic part. As the 16th century rolled around, the actual uh, science of chemistry was emerging from alchemy. They, the alchemists had made some surprising discoveries that, were, that turned out to be useful. And so the science of chemistry began to emerge and the spiritual alchemy, the hermetic uh, philosophy, began to fade for obvious reasons. It, they didn't uh, want to be public about their spirituality for, good, for very good reasons. So the material alchemy became chemistry in science. And the spiritual alchemy was driven underground and relegated to occult science or secret teachings and mystery schools uh, and stayed that way for almost to the present day. Uh, esoteric alchemy emerged from the spiritual philosophy of, of the hermetic tr tradition and an eclectic pursuit of the concepts in the Kabbalah, Eastern mysticism, etc. But hermetic philosophy has a broad appeal, um, especially um, in the uh, area of New Age occult uh, studies and the practice of magic. Almost all magical practices, I can't explain this up, almost all magical practices um, draw from the hermetic, hermetica, and the philosophy is outside somewhat, but still underlying with a, a lot of the earth religions and um, Eastern mysticism that you see in, in our, our modern culture. So text up here, this book, The Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, uh, these, the, the people that, that finally published this book were working on it for years. And I was part of that process. I'm not credited in the book, but um, I, was filing, I was funneling research to them on a constant basis because they were really concerned about getting it right and accurate. So they were asking for anything anybody had. And I want to tell you that anybody who's interested in the sort of, um, it's a solitary practitioner style of um, spiritual magic. It's not a hocus pocus, you know, um, spells on people type. It's a, it's a spiritual practice that um, you take part in you know, in, your, in the privacy of your own chamber, with, with your own um, surroundings and your own ideas. But this book uh, is one of the masterpieces of modern occult, uh, occult uh, literature when it comes to this stuff, only because it's um, so well organized and so detailed. They, they found out uh, and were able to document probably more about Egyptian mysticism in this book than the Egyptian uh, the nation of Egypt has in their in their uh, museums and libraries. It's a very fascinating read. If anybody ever uh, sees it, wants to get a hold of, of something interesting, this is one to read. Hermetic tradition is a non-theistic lineage of Gnostic mysticism attributed to the enigmatic Hermes Trismegistus, author of the Corpus Hermeticum. It's based on the philosophical principles of those teachings. The sacred text dates back to the first and second centuries AD but it was lost for over a thousand years before finally being discovered in Byzantine temples and ordered to, to be shipped to Italy so that it could be uh, translated. At the time, Cosimo de Medici was essentially financing the Renaissance. So he, he had Plato and he had Hermes Trismegistus. And he, said, <laughs> he told his translators, you translate the Corpus Hermeticum, Plato can wait. So that tells you how hungry they were to sort of get back to something that they knew at that time. Um, try to return to what they know. And at the time, um, in the 1400s, that was the last sort of thing that made sense to a lot of people. So that was de Medici's thought. And he was getting very old at the time. So he wanted to have that focus of medicine before he died. Unfortunately, he did not get the whole thing before he died. The enigma of Hermes is that Hermes exists in almost every culture and in many different forms. But the strange thing that keeps arising from the Hermes legend is that they're all accurate, seemingly, and they're all consistent with one another. Um, in, in the Corpus Hermeticum, there's a, uh, a couple of chapters in the beginning that are some of the main uh, points that are made in, in laying out the philosophy. And we, that's in, in, in those chapters, you get a, a conversation that goes on between Hermes Trismegistus and Thoth, the Atlantean, the ibis-headed god 
of wisdom for the Egyptians. Thoth is, all, Thoth is he carries the same enigma as Hermes. He doesn't have a definite date. He's, Thoth is known for the Emerald Tablets. Uh, at, at one point, Alexander supposedly had uh, the Emerald Tablet, tablet of Hermes um, and had it on display at Heliopolis. But this is, was made of a material that was alchemically designed. It was, a, it, was, it was finer than any marble, finer than any stone, and couldn't be destroyed by anything. So the idea that it was on display in Heliopolis during the time of Alexander, yet doesn't exist today, uh, the, only, the only answer to that would be if somebody has it and it's hidden in someone's possession or if it never existed at all. I tend to think it's a fabled thing, um, but whether or not it's a fable doesn't really matter because the underlying truth behind all of it, it can't be denied. Uh, the Masons have the story of Hiram Abiff. Hiram Abiff was a, a Mason uh, who worked in the Greek classical uh, as a, a, an architect. And uh, in, the, in the lore of it, he was the finest, uh, wisest architect. He could build anything. And, uh, and he was actually assassinated by apprentices of his um, attempting to gain his knowledge. So in... Masonic lore, Hiram Abiff is known as the first Hermes. That's what their view of it is. So that's not something to think about. I don't know what is. Um, and, and, you know, if it was true, as unlikely as it is, it's quite, quite possible that would be the Hermes Trismegistus of the other legend um, because he has characteristics. So if he got old, wonder, who knows? But uh, it's interesting to see how these legends cross hairs here. Uh, and then you have the Greek Hermes. He's a, a different uh, sort of bird of a different sort, uh, but he still, even though he's the trickster, he's, uh, <coughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a messenger, but he's a messenger of mind. And um, he, his, his staff was the caduceus, which is used in medical science now um, as a symbol that represents uh, coming together of the culturally, um, scientifically and spiritually concerned individual um, in the form of a healer. Uh, Hermes was the son of Zeus, and he is, coincidentally enough, basically this, the patron uh, deity of the alchemists, for obvious reasons. He's Mercury. Okay, here goes some timeline that should be pretty cool. All of these people have some, some relevance or significance in this story because of uh, some aspect of what they did. Um, here you have a couple of pharaohs, but most importantly, Imhotep was the first of The Emerald Tablet comes into play as far back as 1364 BC. Uh, so you see it's like uh, we're, we're back pretty far in time, and it's already starting to shape up like there's some things happening in, in, the, in the cosmic consciousness that are bringing people online about the idea of properties of the earth and properties of, uh, of itself. Um, the four elements came into uh, play with developing this idea that there could be a communion. And so the four elements theory um, was his way of reconciling that. And so you have here Alexander in 332, supposedly had the Emerald Tablet, uh, the temple in Siwa, and um, it was put on display at Heliopolis, supposedly. The Kitib Sir Al-Asar uh, was an, a translation of the Emerald Tablet that um, blossomed in a whole no on a whole other strand of um, philosophical thought um, in the Arab world. Moors in Spain was the first uh, uh, Spanish translations in 711, um, and then I put in here Quetzalcoatl, recent things. Quetzalcoatl really was that same Hermes for the Mayans. Albertus Magnus is significant. This is, um, by all accounts, the, the most superior uh, mind of the, uh, the Middle Ages by far. Uh, he trained Thomas Aquinas. He um, wrote tremendous compendiums on alchemy and um, he when when Egypt was opened up he uh, 
tore, he tore through it like uh, nobody's business. He uh, published Egyptian Secrets of White and Black Art for Man and Beast. Uh, it's a gigantic book. But um, everybody who you read, when you look, when you're trying to research Albertus Magnus, they called him Magnus. He, he, that wasn't his name, but they called him Magnus because he had such amazing intellectual and, and uh, mind strength. Nobody had the mathematics, the philosophy, the um, articulate uh, way of uh, expressing things the way he did. Um, and when you look for him also, his main uh, writings are extensive uh, in, in alchemy. All right, so here at the end of the 1200s, you start seeing the bans happening. You got the Franciscan ban at 1272, and uh, King Alphonse warned people not to, uh, not to practice alchemy. This was what I talked about in the beginning. Um, it, was, it was very prevalent among the clergy. Now the bans get bad. All through the 1300s, um, you see that it, um, it started to be pushed underground. Uh, people that were openly practicing it with the full blessing of the church and state were now afraid because their threats were beginning to rise. A papal, papal bull was issued by uh, Pope John the 22nd. We're, in, we're still going to be going through those dark ages for two slides here, but in the middle of that, you still had some significant things developing. Nicholas Flamel published Figures Hieroglyphique, and this was a another massive compendium, but this time it was, it had so much art. Um, you can really look to him uh, for the direction of uh, the alchemical art because he was one of the visionaries at the very beginning to lay down that sort of coded, um, you know, archetypal hidden uh, imagery, hidden word behind the imagery. Is at this time they started to write the words that in a way that couldn't that could be interpreted any number of ways, a very ambiguous way that they that they tried to record what they were doing, but they the details were in the art, uh, so that's you know, that's why the art's so important. But here's the two guys that we just talked about: Marcello Mar Ficino and uh, and uh, Cosimo di Medici. Um, they're as much responsible for preserving the Hermeticum and some of these rare and gorgeous uh, alchemical works as anyone else, and also the Renaissance. The Renaissance couldn't have really happened without them. Uh, the, the Di Medici family and the Borgias, a few others, financed the entire um, Renaissance. These were scholars of a, of a level that we don't get to see very much nowadays. They spent their entire lives trying to write things down so that other people could read them. And here you start to have some of the practice of magic. And these are significant people. I w didn't want to make this uh, a discussion on uh, ritual magic or occultism, but uh, you can't get around them, uh, that, uh, that concept completely uh, when talking about this subject. So I, I figured uh, I needed to include those magicians and witches, whoever it was that, um, leaned back on that, uh, that hermeticism and alchemy um, convergence. Agrippa, Henry Cornelius Agrippa wrote the, the three books on occult philosophy, 1531. Those books are still the basis of almost all high magical systems in some way or another. Um, Paracelsus, German alchemist, not a very liked guy, came up with the concept of the tri Tria Prima, the Tria Prima are the three um, domains, the physical body, the mental self, and the spiritual self. In alchemy, they were, they were uh, salt, sulfur, and mercury, respectively. And, but we, uh, after we get past this stuff, John Dee, um, <laughs> it's an incredible story that I wish I could tell you guys. But uh, if you want to research it before the third class is over, I'm going to provide... Uh, a couple of links to a documentary and uh, some, some uh, easy reading uh, that could tell you that story in a pretty accurate way. Um, it's not always told accurately, but uh, John Dee was the, uh, was the alchemist to Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, he was a little bit of a weird guy, I would have to say, but uh, he 
everyone believed that this guy had the ability to, um, you know, he was a wizard. And the reason that he needs to be included is because every uh, image that we see today of wizards like Merlin or uh, Dumbledore or whatever, it came from him. He may not look exactly like them, but that's where those concepts came from. Uh, all of those fairy tale legends with wizards, he was the wizard that everyone knew who wrote those things. So it's very uh, likely that it was him that they had in mind when they uh, wrote those. Uh, Edward Kelly, uh, that's a strange bird there. Uh, he has to go with John Dee because he and Dee met up at, at uh, some point um, during, that, during the, the late part of the, of the Middle Ages and went on a quest. They uh, traveled to Prague and Elizabeth I, her idea was that she wanted to have an alchemical kingdom. She, she wasn't, she was very, she felt like she was above the beliefs and practices of the average people and uh, felt she was more intelligent than that and wanted to think for herself. And so the alchemists and uh, sages and philosophers uh, gathered around her because they were safe there. Um, so she wanted a magical sort of pagan kingdom and uh, Edward Kelly teamed up with John Dee to go pave that way, but they got kind of sidetracked and it's a very funny story. The kingdom never kind of shook out that way, but that story is a, boy, it's a whopper. Uh, here we get into the, we're heading, we're almost get, getting to the 1600s where they're, they're gonna lay off the, um, the real persecution of, of alchemy. So it was able to survive right through that uh, really hundred years of some difficulty. Um, it wasn't over, but uh, they made it through some of the toughest times, but the hermetic tradition was still humming sort of under the radar of thing. It, it was very, um, it became a hermetic. That's why we have the term hermetically sealed, or if you don't come in public, get out in public, you're a hermit. You know, you stay indoors all the time and you don't come out, you're a hermit. And uh, if you can't get into a container, it's hermetically sealed, right? So that's where that, those terms come from, hermeticism, because the hermit was known as someone you didn't get to see him very much, and uh, for good reason. Isaac Newton um, was re mostly responsible for the English translator, translation of the corpus. So he's significant. He, uh, it, and it really, when you look at um, people like him, sort of Renaissance men that you had um, popping up in the late 15, early 1600s, um, you see a lot of that. Um, like Leonardo da Vinci, you know, he was an artist of grand scale but he also made navigation devices and also measuring devices. And uh, the artist of the day was more than just a painter or a sculptor. Um, that's, you can see that in the sculptor. You can see that that sculptor was not just a sculptor. This was someone of incredible, incredible ambition and uh, fortitude. Here's Giordano Bruno. He is a saint now uh, with a statue in, in uh, Vatican City. He's a Franciscan monk who was burned at the stake for alchemy during his time. This book here by Frances Yates, Dame Frances Yates. She is, um, she's an enigmatic, an enigmatic uh, writer. It's a strange book kind of, but um, the story it tells is accurate. And it's, uh, if you, you wanted to learn more about Bruno, I would say pick up Yates's book. Okay, now this is where it gets fun for me because now we're having the emergence of the great magicians, uh, well, the moment I was all waiting for. Um, in the 1700s, early 1700s, you had uh, Samuel Richter uh, form the Order of the Golden Dawn and not long after the Rosy Cross. So the Ros Rosicrucians and the Golden Dawn uh, were, were starting to take root to um, make a, a run at it as a secret society, a sacred society. The Illuminati, Adam Weishaupt, um, Francis Barrett, uh, the book, uh, Magus, I have slides for them, so I'm going to show you that. But uh, this is where things start to really get interesting um, in this blending of Hermeticism, um, Eastern mysticism, and alchemy. The terms start to converge here in a big way, and the, uh, the works start to make a lot more sense. Francis Barrett was the first to um, translate the Agrippa's three books on occult philosophy that I mentioned just a, a little while ago. So it was a hundred years later, um, and they had, Agrippa's books were thought to be very powerful 
uh, probably the most technical um, magical texts available. So if you wanted to get anywhere with magic, you wanted that information and it, it hadn't been translated. So when Barrett um, translated that book, translated those books into this magus, the celestial intelligencer, it blew up and it, like crazy. It, it took the literary world by storm. It became a star overnight and the book still sells like hotcakes today. Um, it's, it's a compendium of, that includes Agrippa's three books and it also brings the ideas of hermeticism, the elements, um, and you know, uh, the whole idea of the, um, this prima materia and this um, advancing consciousness along with the purification or rarification of high qualities um, that you see in Hebrew Kabbalah and all, all, all the mystic, mystic practices of the East highly uh, geared towards the mental process um, as vehicle for the spiritual. Eliphas Levi was, he's usually presented as the first um, Western occultist of that era of the, of the greats. Um, at this time in history, uh, what was going on was really remarkable. Um, you had the emergence of this new sort of uh, wave of people that you know were not afraid to you know experiment and and find out what this stuff was all you know they were pulling up these texts and they were like somebody put a lot of work into this um and this has nothing to do with any of that nonsense that that was happening when people were you know getting killed over it and so a lot of the high intellectual and intellectually minded people of the west began to uncover the mystical texts have them translated and publish them. Um, Elvis Levi, Alphonse Louis Consant was one of the masters. His uh, transcendental magic was a breakthrough because it, he was a French guy, um, but it was, uh, it was suddenly something that people could grasp. They, they suddenly said, well, well this, isn't, uh, this isn't strange at all. You know, all the Eastern mysticism they had seen was snake charmers and, and sort, of, sort of taboo. Uh, this didn't look so strange. The symbolism did, but, you know, they were willing to, they were willing to listen. Uh, this figure here in the, in the image inset is um, Levi's rendition of the Sabbatic goat, Baphomet, uh, goat of Mendes. This is a symbol that, you, that was existent in alchemy at the time. It was a hermaphroditic goat. You'll see hermaphrodite, hermaphroditic uh, beings in alchemy, alchemical art all the time because in alchemy, everything is equally both things. They're equally male, female, and gender, equally positive and negative. All of the, all of the things that, uh, that define our uh, frequencies. And so the idea of the, the herma hermaphroditic entity is a representation of the alchemical process. The uh, goat in question has the caduceus uh, right in front of his heart. So it's a significant thing. Adam Weishaupt was the uh, organizer and founder of the Bavarian Illuminati. Everybody has their conspiracies about the conspiracy theories about this. And um, I don't know that it's a conspiracy, uh, but it does fall in line with what the conspiracy theorists talk about, which is the irony of it, because you can see why it would be easy to uh, think that, uh, you know, this organ underground organization was, you know, out to take over the world if you were a conspiracy theorist, because, you know, this is, this is a time when, you know, the European Enlightenment was happening, and uh, suddenly there were a, a ton of, like, really uh, intelligent people that were trying to rewrite the way... Uh, the way people understood things in history and literature and science um, wholesale. They were, they were changing philosophy, they were changing science, and the, really the, the sciences didn't exist before then in, in any real, real form that, that we could think of today. So as the Enlightenment was pressing forward, you had sciences like psychology and uh, chemistry developing uh, meta science is becoming um, organized and becoming uh, foundational. Um, so Weisumpt happened to be like the smartest person of the entire enlightenment. And you will never hear this in, <laughs> in a, any history lesson, but uh, 
it's a fact. I mean, and you can only find that out if you research the people around him and the things that people were thinking and saying of him. This was an incredibly highly intellectually uh, gifted person. Uh, he became the ultimate snob and uh, had some serious financing behind him. And he moved to Bavaria. And uh, from that location, the Bavarian Illuminati was formed and the celebration happened in 1776. <clears throat> coincidentally the same year of the American independence. So it was a big celebration all over the place. And uh, Wiesam uh, quite rapidly took over the spiritual sort of uh, aspect of Masonic, every Masonic lodge that, within his reach. So it, it spread very quickly, um, but it fell out of favor pretty quickly too. Uh, it, was, it was a threat to a lot of people for no good reason, but uh, you know how people feel when uh, somebody thinks they're smarter. And here's, here's a couple of my favorites that we have, I have slides for them. Um, McGregor, McGregor Mathers, Crowley, Carl Jung, Rasputin even, what a, what a character, and Abraham Maslow. And you might think, what the hell do they have? What does Maslow have to do with it? Every bit of a lot of uh, philosophical and, and sort of foundational uh, concepts that uh, Maslow employed and later developed into the hierarchy of needs and so forth, came from those same principles of, uh, that you find in alchemy. There's that creepy uh, Grigori Rasputin. His story is another one I would love to tell you, but if I told you that, we'd have to go to sleep tonight and start again. Suffice it to say, he was a crazy character in history. Uh, both of these two are Russians, um, and I have a ton of respect for Helena Blavatsky, she um, she went against all odds. They were they were you, it was easy to get killed in Russia back then for anything having to do with uh, with a an unseen thing that was going on. You know, it's, we have that same impression of them today, but it was very bad then. Uh, for her uh, contribution, she was recognized as a mystic and that could actually tell the future or or could see remotely. And uh, she was later in life. Um, sort of exposed as a heretic, or a charlatan, I should say, um, because uh, people kind of were, were, had been working for a long time to catch her in a lie or, or catch her trying to you know, embellish so that they could nail her because she was, that was her living. So uh, towards the end of her life, she got old, she was not quite as slick, and uh, she kind of she fell out of favor in, with the bourgeoisie aristocrats because they, felt like they had exposed her in some way. I don't think there's anything that can be uh, said about her other than the fact that her, her theosophical society formed way back then is going strong today and has such an area. So Blavatsky was a, was a giant. These two right here are mega giants. You have Samuel L. McGregor Mathers on the left and Aleister Crowley on the right. These two are responsible for most of what we know about um, high magic, they call it, um, about um, the ultimate expression of this amalgam of thought that came pouring in during the time that they lived. Um, if you think about this period of time, it's from like you know the late 1800s to just after World War II, and you think about the absolute uh, absolutely just gigantic people that were alive at that time winston churchill you know, <laughs> fdr it it's just it's just uh mind-boggling to think einstein you know it, it goes on and on all you have to do is just think for a second and someone will come to your mind that was you know that's considered the representative of you know they they've become the archetype of their science or their literature or whatever it was and if that's uh could be said about anybody in uh, contemporary uh, occult literature. It would be these two gentlemen here. Um, McGregor Mathers uh, formed the what's still the acting body of the Golden Dawn. Uh, when Crowley and he met, they uh, actually made a deal to become the sort of spiritual side of Freemasonry that's uh, concerned with secret, ma secret magical ceremonies and um, rites. They're doing the magic that those two installed in, in those institutions. Carl Jung, 
a Swiss psych psychiatrist and truly a visionary. Uh, anything that you see emerging that are humanistic, um, spiritual, expansive, open and open and uh, exploratory, that's due to this guy. Uh, if he wouldn't have been there and done what he did um, in breaking away from Freud, we might all be, we might all know psychiat psychiatry and psychology as Freud's world. And that would be a horrible nightmare. Jung's ideas way back when he broke from, from Freud, who was his mentor essentially, uh, were that uh, the subconscious mind contained, if it contained the nightmares that Freud suggested, then it must also contain the activity and all the other things that come from us that we don't initiate. So Jung was a really important figure when it comes to um, the whole thing. And he's in the story of alchemy because at 55, he had already written all of his major works. Everything that we read from Jung right now in the classroom as uh, in undergraduate school or graduate school, if you're, if you're looking to uh, become a psychiatrist or a psychologist, um, you're going to be exposed to Jung. And at 55, he was still not satisfied uh, because he, his, his idea of archetypes and symbolic meaning as critical vehicles um, for psychological ex exploration was unfulfilled still. And uh, what he did finally discover was alchemy. And to try to update his existing work with some extra uh, archetypal imagery. So kudos to him for recognizing it and being willing to, uh, to step out there and uh, say it. Uh, I'm going to try to show you guys a little clip at some point. For something in between, you know, something that linked that remote past with, with the present moment. Uh, and I found, to my amazement, it is alchemy. So all the later works that Jung produced were based around the, the imagery and uh, ideas in alchemy, even the alchemical process, which is for another group, for another class, but it's, that's a real interesting thing. And that's when we get into uh, some of the useful things that we can do with it. This guy right here happens to be um, a hero of mine. He was a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemason, but he was also the most prolific um, esoteric writer and speaker in the history of the world. Um, he was, uh, he was to the esoteric what uh, Socrates was to, to the Socratic philosophy uh, theory. Um, it, his, he's recorded over 8,000 two-hour lectures uh, in, on these topics. He uh, did these lectures uh, twice a week. Uh, for the entirety of his life. He, uh, there's a museum uh, of books that looks like a library, but it's a museum um, in Los Angeles called the Manly P. Hall Philosophical Library. Uh, published one work that a lot of uh, you might be familiar with called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And it was the first totally comprehensive uh, of uh, every spiritual tradition known to the modern world. Uh, he had a knack for understanding and being able to put into words some of these complex ideas and concepts, and even the symbols. If, uh, if you don't have secret teachings, go out and get it, or I'll, I'm going to provide you guys a, li a link to that. There is an online one. Um, the best one online is actually at the uh, CIA library, right? So the, our government, does maybe know, know something, uh, something's important uh, because the secret teachings of all ages is there and it's being served from that library, but you can get downloads of PDF too. It is a kind of a big book, but uh, it's an amazing thing to have. It's, I mean, coffee table book from hell. You, you know, you can literally find something about anything that's considered belief, um, spiritual, uh, philosophical, religious, uh, and even, uh, fringe science. I mean, the, the guy was a storehouse of just 
fascinating information. Uh, Timothy Leary, um, I wasn't, he wasn't in the plans or anything, but um, he made his way onto the, to the presentation because uh, of how remarkable he was, number one, but also because he was a very advanced uh, psychiatrist. He, he was the head of the department at Harvard. And then when things got dicey for him there because of his experiments with LSD on students, um, he moved to Berkeley, California, and became the head of the department at Berkeley. And those, two, those happen to be the two top schools in the world. So anybody who thinks he was a quack or, you know, crapped out on his career or something, just doesn't know Leary. Um, this guy discovered something that he knew had the potential to change the world. And it happened to do with um, a deep understanding of brain chemistry and the effects of psychoactive substances of that sort um, on the human mind and the ability for it to um, cause awakenings and to uh, to dampen and deaden the ego to a, to a degree that uh, he felt, and so did many others, would potentially end war and uh, violence. So his cause was just, and, and his method, I have no problem with it. Uh, it Somebody had to live. Somebody had to walk those paths at that time for us, and uh, nobody could have done it with more class than him. Uh, he actually lived his whole life out and never sold out, and broadcast his death on YouTube. Um, you can watch that too, and it's, it's not just his death; it's the weeks and couple of months leading up to it, and to see how much of an alchemical life he lived. He he had a system, and the system worked for him. And he decided that he was not going to live, he was not gonna die in a sad way as a tragedy, that he was going to go out uh, celebrating it. Uh, his, his chance to go and experience what everyone's been speculating about their entire lives. And I believe he may have done it, but uh, if you watch it, you can see how incredibly uh, organized and just, uh, just meticulous this guy was about everything, everything uh, physical, uh, mental and, and spiritual, he was just a t really together person as far as that goes. So I consider him an alchemist of the highest order. And he always said he was uh, continuing the work of Aleister Crowley. So uh, I, I respect him for that. Here, Alan Watts, uh, he's an English author and lecturer. Uh, he did, he, he's, he passed away now, uh, 73, but uh, his work lives on. Um, Alan Watts is one of the most entertaining uh, philosophers to watch and listen to. There are uh, hours and hours of video footage on YouTube available of Watts and Terence McKenna, the other one in this picture. Um, to these two guys, to me, they're heroes. They're, they're also giants. Like, that's a good, good word for a lot of these people is giants because everyone who came before or since is just not quite as big as them. Uh, so when I say giant, that's what I mean. I mean, you know, Hey, there's a lot of good, you know, very intelligent, uh, capable people that have said or tried to do what they've done. But, there's only so many giants. And Alan Watts and Terence McKenna were giants. Um, Watts uh, was a, a professor for a short time, but he, he didn't need it. He, he sort of intellectual, intellectualized himself right out of academia and just settled into talking on camera for huge sums of money and going and doing lectures in, in person at these select um, locations throughout the Western United States, sometimes Europe, look at the other side uh, without judgment and, and realize that, you know, we may be all wrong. And that's, that's the great thing about his philosophy. He always, as, as much as he sounds like an elitist and like he's uh, above people for what he does, he, he always, always ends the statement of uh, matter of factness by saying, but then again, I could be full of crit shit. So, you know, the, I really love that guy. And he was an alchemist in the truest sense. Um, with the, his life, his lifestyle, how he raised his kids, um, and what he spoke about. He, he spoke about these same ideas, the mind, body, spirit connection, uh, which is really at the core of why you're here. Uh, that's what that has been at the core of my own philosophy for uh, ever since I can remember. And uh, I found an expression for it. And uh, part of that expression included this incredible uh, really beautiful world of alchemy. Terence McKenna was another alchemist in the sense that um, 
he was an explorer of the, uh, the chemical mind as well. Uh, he discovered uh, psilocybin mushrooms when he was uh, just getting out of, about to get out, graduate from college. He's a highly educated guy, uh, one of the smartest people that's ever lived also. Uh, these are two of the smartest guys that literally have ever lived. And you would, you'll see that if you ever watch some of their stuff. Um, but McKenna in particular um, had a, you know, a, one of those um, ego death experiences um, in the Amazon when he traveled there to, to look for psychoactive plants. He basically spent his uh, postdoctoral doctoral, uh, year or two and then extended that into the rest of his life um, traveling the world, experiment, experimenting with uh, shamanic cultures, um, jungle cultures, and uh, psychoactive plants. His main thing, though, was the mushroom. Uh, if you ever see any kind of pop culture involving the mushroom, um, there's a good chance that that image probably had something to do with Terrence McKenna. Yeah, I rest both of these guys. They were incredible. Something, maybe. Well, now they've, they've, they've put our numbers in the tens of millions and it's going up. So, um, you know, this is someone, Doreen Valentine, um, and this lady, <laughs> I mean, her books were not necessarily something that I flocked to or anything, but uh, when, you, when you realize what she contributed, dating all the way back to the earliest times when this stuff was coming out, um, in the 50s, basically, um, after the war, after... Uh, you know, the, the kings of, of the occult revival had passed away. Their literature was, was avid. It was everywhere. And uh, you had this sort of earth belief wanting to emerge from the ancient roots of the ancestors in Europe. You had the Germanic, Celtic, uh, you know, Saxon um, thread, uh, Druids, modern day. It really started to um, happen in the mid-50s when Gerald Gardner published his book. But Wicca, as you guys have probably already know, um, became a religion in our lifetimes. So Valiente was uh, something else. She's got uh, 20 books, you know, uh, so her literary contributions are giant too. Dolores Oshcroft, Nowicki, one of my favorite um, authors in the esoteric and occult uh, literature. She has over 20 books. They're all successful and they're all about something slightly different. So the, the, uh, the wellspring of information and, uh, and really philosophical balance that this woman provided to our community is nothing short of mind boggling. Uh, I just put four books here to give you an idea of the, how, she, how broad her, her talent was. She could write about you know, a compendium of history on one and then she's, next thing you know, she's writing about the Hebrew Kabbalah or, you know, uh, this middle pillar idea, pyramids, uh, or, or it was a manual on how to do it. Like she was just amazing. So um, I wanted to include her too. She was one of the first in the line to um, identify the magic that was emerging uh, in the 60s, really, um, with alchemy. And to me, this is the ultimate alchemist. If we're going to talk about where does alchemy for, you know, the, the actual material alchemy have a representation in anything that would make any sense to us? You know, we know that you can't turn uh, lead into metal, right? I mean, lead into gold, right? Or base metals of any kind to gold. And that's not exactly true. Uh, they are doing it uh, at the Hadron Super Collider um, in Switzerland, but uh, it's very costly. It costs more than the gold they make. But this guy right here actually was the first one to technically succeed in the alchemical process. He um, is a Swiss scientist who actually lived pretty far into our era, and uh, he synthesized, uh, he isolated the, uh, the chemical composition of lysergic acid dilithamide, uh, LSD, and uh, was the first alchemist to actually rarefy a chemical known to be found in the human brain uh, synthetically. He sat on that. He knew it, what, what it was. It, it was a deliberate thing. And uh, he, you know, he's, he's a historic person now because uh, at the time we didn't know that uh, it, or 
uh, we didn't yet know that uh, we knew there was chemicals in the brain, but we didn't know necessarily that those same chemicals existed in, uh, in plants per se, or could be synthesized like chemically in a laboratory back then. Um, they didn't, uh, didn't put two and two together that, you know, a, uh, what, what they call opioid receptors in the brain now were existed in a plant. The reason that we have what's called opioid receptors or cannabinoids as uh, neurotransmitters are because they found it in the plant first and then saw the reaction, did an analysis and, and isolated it that way. But Albert Hoffman found this uh, substance by way of his just genius and guile. Five years later, um, he was at his laboratory still trying to see what he was gonna do with it. And he says he accidentally ingested 500 micrograms of it. Um, he said it's soaked through his skin and whatnot, but um, they call that day, April 14th, 1943, Bicycle Day. And a lot of people don't know this, know that, that April 14th, Bicycle Day, but I'll tell you why it is, because uh, he hadn't been heard from for a little while, and uh, a girl that knew him and a friend of his went to his lab, and the door was locked, but they knew he was in there, so they were beating on the door and screaming and everything, and they heard something going on. So the, the guy kicked in the door finally, thinking that he was in trouble. And uh, they found him lying flat on his back, riding an invisible bicycle, talking about being on his way home. So <laughs> that's the day of the bicycle and uh, bicycle day. And uh, Albert Hoffman is an incredible uh, story. He, uh, not long after that, once the world found out what it was, you know, Mr. Timothy Leary and the rest, um, he himself, you know, he didn't tune in, turn on and drop out like uh, Leary was saying to do, but he kind of did. He uh, backed sort of away from science a little and uh, he wasn't, didn't want to get in trouble for like, like anybody else did. He, he, was, he said he's, he did his thing. So he kept doing science on his own, but um, he spent the rest of his life, he lived to 102. He spent the rest of his life um, actively speaking out against war, violence, um, and um, making the same argument that, uh, that Leary and others were making, that he thought that there was a potential that this, this chemical could end war. I, I grabbed this meme and I put it on here just because um, I couldn't find the quote anywhere else, and I, I thought the picture was pretty uh, poignant. He, uh, you know, you saw what a refined guy he was, and we know how brilliant he was, but yeah, he was, he, he discovered something in that experience that uh, an alchemical uh, transformation that uh, was cause enough to make him spend the rest of his life soul searching and uh, wanting to connect with people and, and promote love instead of uh, the, what he saw was a corrupt idea of human existence. So, all right, we're going to, Finished with that little history lesson. I hope everybody enjoyed that. I hope everybody's still here. I couldn't see you guys with that, with that on, but I wanted to get the big pictures of it. I just wanted to bring it to today, you know, by giving a story that didn't break. So what did you guys think of that? You can turn your mics on if you want. Um, I wa I'd like to know what you thought of the, uh, was there anything along the way of that story, that timeline that, was surprising to you or was most of it something that you pretty much knew about and it may be a different way a lot of it i didn't know but um not surprising i think uh, you know i was when i when I just was designing this workshop the only thing i could think was all this history i'll be careful but i wanted to i hope that i could get through it quick enough without rushing that it would be something fun to watch and and it will be more meaningful as we move into the other material as well so um i hope you guys enjoyed that so john um, where was the comment about the aliens oh uh, the aliens man see i would have included the aliens because i wanted to include you know uh some of my favorite authors actually um eric von donekin and the sort but right. um mm -hmm. but uh they weren't necessarily alchemists and if i go on a rabbit trail like that this will never get done <laughs> that's, that's, that's really the problem with this topic is that it's too good of a topic you yeah. know you could literally talk about it you know for the rest of your life if you if you wanted to 
And it really is a, a sort of a fairy tale in real life type of thing. So um, I hope that was an interesting thing for you. I, I really appreciated the I, time. I, I, I got lost, you know, in, um, in time when you were going through the timeline, which it was kind of a cool experience, you know, so I appreciated that, that gorgeous timeline we did on everybody. That was really interesting. Thank you. I, I wanted to tell it like a story instead yeah. of, you know, and so that was the, the plan, you know. Well, Diane, what did you say? Oh, I was just going to oh, say I that saying, a lot of it was review for me. But there were some people I had not ever heard of. Ever heard of. Um, it was um, nice to it was nice to hear about some more hear about some more female wizards, female if you will, wizards, other than well, Madame Blavatsky. Yeah, that's usually that's all, usually all you get in in the, in the mm -hmm. literature, you know. It says it was her, then she sort of faded, you know, and died, and then it was, you know, all these guys. And, you know, that's something that uh, <laughs> that happens with the alchemy, too. With alchemy, um, by the way, if, if you guys ask a question or something, just hit your mic and off back again so we don't get any echo. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the misconception is that the alchemists were only men, and they were these sort of, you know, hidden guys that were, you know, uh, above everyone in their minds and uh, sort of elitist and were, you know, diabolical in their, their intention and that it was only men and, and there was no women. That's not the case. Um, but with women, it's, it is the case that there were, there were far fewer um, that were alchemists per se. The women that were the alchemists were hidden because they uh, tend to be smarter and uh, more wily. You know, women are usually much smarter than men uh, when it comes to things like that. The men want to show their ass and the women do their work because they don't care about showing their ass. So uh, at the same time that, you know, the alchemy alchemical sort of lineage was of trying to make gold, you had some incredibly um, gifted uh, spiritual women all over the place. But uh, they were, if they thought better of it, they would Kind of keep that to themselves because, you know, as you know, as you all know, uh, throughout that time in history, women didn't have much of a, uh, a say in things. Um, you know, we, we didn't even have to get the right to vote until well into the United States history. So to think that you know they're going to come out with some of this you know incredibly uh, intellectual and uh, developed stuff, uh, that would be a far-fetched thing. Not that they didn't have it; they did, um, just like the shamans did. This is this is a thread of knowledge that goes much further than any book or any uh, any form of symbolism or any culture even. This is a, a this is a thread of, of truth that speaks to an undercurrent um, that some call the, the Akashic record, um, some call it Gaia consciousness, some call it uh, you know the tarot speaking to them or astrology when when they. Uh, assess the alignment of planets and the energies of those planets. It's, a, it's an awareness of the, these uh, trajectories in our lives and in our worlds that, um, that have a magnetism and a, and a push and pull going on with them, with their energies. Uh, women are more, much more uh, sensitive to that. So that's why, that's why at, the, at the end, of the close of that era, you had a lot of the, what we know about with the, the witch burnings and you know even here in America it happened with the Salem witch trial. Uh, that was the tail end of that mess, but women were catching it at that time because the men had already sort of locked away their tools and learned how to sort of be you know discreet, you know. But uh, the women were trying to break out and show their uh, ability, and uh, they did, they weren't rewarded very kindly for that. So, um, but uh, you know. I wanted to kind of, I knew that those topics are going to come up and they always do when you talk about the esoteric. You're always going to have um, thoughts and ideas about periods in time where one belief was at war with another or, you know, um, trying to commit a genocide against another. It's, 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 this is what we do in human history. If you go back to beyond, to the very early uh, days of the, you know, the era of conquerors, before the, wor the world was divided up. You know, everybody was still f battling for a chunk. You know, you, the Persian Empire grew into this gigantic thing and broke up, and it grew bigger and then broke it up. You know, Greece, they thought it would last forever. It didn't. It didn't. It, but it took almost 500 years for it to decline. You know, it was at least 200 when the decline was evident before it finally was 
something else. But uh, when the world was being divided up among our distant archaic ancestors, um, the ideas that they carried with them during this, this, these conflicts were, were, fought, were fought over for all the wrong reasons. Because what none of them were willing to admit or, or they didn't see, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, some of them didn't see it, was that they were all saying the same thing. The core of what they were saying was the same thing. They were arguing over someone's name against someone else's name. So one symbol against another, you know, the archetypes have always been there. It's, it's how do, how do you connect with them? All right. Um, the, the, the Hellenistic period, um, the, the pantheon of, of Greek gods. Listen, there, I, I don't think there's ever been a culture more intellectually um, advanced in the, their approach, at least. Yeah, they were, yeah, they had their blinders on in a lot of areas, but to, to think that that, that, that culture um, didn't understand that the pantheon of gods was a archetypal structure, they actually thought Zeus was throwing lightning at them. That's crazy talk. They did not. They think of it in, as mythology just like we do. They were just very serious about it. They were very serious. If, it, if, they, if they felt a god or a goddess, you know, pulling or pushing on them, you know, they needed to react to it, they would do extreme, they would do whatever it took. To, to pacify that situation, because whether the God existed or not, let's face it, they were going to suffer, right? So what, what did it matter if the God existed or not? It really didn't, you know, and it's similar to religion and, and philosoph uh, spiritual philosophies now. Nowadays, um, whether, whether the stories that we read and the, and the doctrines that we, that we learn are true stories per se, or that, of actual events that happened and uh, verifiable, doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. You know, what really matters is if it means something to you. If it helps you, I don't care if you worship a shoe. You know, if you, if you have a, you know, it doesn't really matter what it is. It's the bottom line is what's going to get the job done. Um, and that's really what this entire thing is about. So I think that what we just brought together is an important step towards getting into the actual details. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take a break, guys, because it's break time at least, right? I don't even know. I haven't. I don't look at clocks very much. It's uh, um, the next step for us is going to be um, a fun one. Um, let me pull it up so I can tell you exactly what it is, and and we'll go ahead and close here um, soon. Because I know if you if there's anybody who scheduled this and uh, is going to need to end, I don't want to, you know what I mean, be uh, holding someone up. But I wanted to give you guys an idea of what I'm going to talk about next time. And it's not just going to be me talking either. We're going to, we're going to get engaged in some, some really interesting stuff. Okay. So the next, um, workshop is called living a magical life. And it is beginning to see how these ideas thought and, and, uh, developing, um, threads of, of, um, understanding, can actually be sort of scaffolded into our our structures in our modern life. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, seven steps to the alchemical operation, um, and that's at the core of uh, uh, spiritual alchemy. Um, it's a sort of problem solving and and day to day uh, concept um, that's very interesting, and I'm sure you'll find it fascinating and, and fun. And we're going to talk about cosmic influences. So. Uh, that's going to be an interesting one, and we're and I'd like to do a uh, to that so, um, thing, a little bit, um, but it's going to be a, a sort of the concept of the principles of um, sort of the uh, physics of being human, um, and that's how uh, how these chemical processes actually become a spiritual spiritual uh, pursuit. So, I hope. I'll, um, I hope everybody can make it. I'm gonna, hey, John, what's the uh, day and time? Um, next that's session? what I was going to say. If we can, if we can decide, okay. are all you guys okay with the same day and time? I next think you Sunday? might be. Well, as long as okay? Carol can still grill. <laughs> yeah, I mean. As long as the entertainment comes along with it. Right. Is, if everyone's in agreement. I got three day weekend, so. Yeah, if everybody's in agreement, we'll just do next Sunday, same time. Good. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Sure. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I've got I've got it broken into two pieces. We'll take a break in the middle. It'll be great. All right.
Thank Good you guys. Job. Good Good job. Job. I love Bye. you all. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Good seeing you all. Have a